Hello and welcome to M419 Global. It's uh, Thomas with Natalia. Uh, and we are excited to be back with another interview with a special person. And um, this is just really about something very simple. And it's about uh, ordinary people doing extraordinary things, just following the Lord and doing what God's put upon their heart to do and to impact other people and to encourage them uh, to go deeper into uh, what the Lord has for them. And it really comes from the, uh, the verse in Matthew 419, follow me and I will make you fishermen of men. Okay, so I get to do my spiel now again. I'll talk all about our social media. So we are still currently on Facebook, M419 Global on Facebook, as well as Instagram. We also have a YouTube page as well, M419 Global. Uh, our website, again, is still being worked on. We will have details on that very shortly. We are very excited about that, and we got our new logo. So, we have a very special guest. I'm very excited. Um, Kara, I met her via another friend, <laughs> and she has a awesome and powerful story, and we got to talk a couple of weeks ago. I think we were on the phone probably an hour, and we had a little church when we were on the phone, and just transparency, and just talking about life, and just being real, just being real, but she has a powerful powerful story um she speaks she's got uh gosh she's got youtube she's got TikTok. she's got facebook she's got instagram um i'm sure you have other stuff too kara but she is she has a tremendous story that has to be told and she is just she's just a powerhouse in my book just from everything that she's been through and how she's taking what she went through and she is using it as momentum now to create awareness, to just push people forward, to never, ever, ever give up, no matter what happens to them and it doesn't define them. So Kara, I'm so excited to have you. Um, we've been looking forward to this mm -hmm. and just take it away, girl, just share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you guys too. So, and like you said, we did, we had straight up church, you know, a couple, <laughs> a couple weeks ago and I enjoyed that conversation so much. So I'm happy to share it here and continue it here. So the biggest part of my story is when I was 15 years old, I was kidnapped by a stranger. I was taken from my friend's front yard by a man that never set off any red flags. You think that there's going to be that moment where you get that tingly spider sense and I never got that. So he approached me, he said he was selling magazine or he was giving away pamphlets and he asked if he could give them to me so I could put them inside. And you know, this whole time stayed a good distance away from me. And when I said, yeah, I'll take them, he entered my personal space. And that was the first time that kind of the spidey sense tingled and he put a gun up to the side of my neck and he made me go with him. He kidnapped me. Um, he sexually assaulted me. He had me for 18 hours until I escaped. So while he was sleeping, I was restrained. Um, I had my hands kind of up here. I was able to undo the restraints on my hands. I had a leg restraint. I was able to undo that and escape his apartment. I ran out and there was a car driving across the parking lot. I ran out in front of it, and waved it down and they took me to law enforcement. Whenever I got to law enforcement, they took me, you know, they, they tried to take me back to the apartment so I could identify the apartment while I was waiting on my parents to get there. And they found out that he, he had gone, he'd left. And so I went on and, you know, went and got uh, an exam done at the hospital and they brought me uh, a photo lineup from the information that I was able to give them from the apartment of things that I had memorized. So they brought me a photo lineup before I even had my exam. I was sitting in the waiting room waiting and I identified my captor. Uh, when they went and searched his apartment, they found that he, they thought that he had probably been involved in some other things. And about a month later, he was positively linked to the murder of three other girls in Virginia. So I live in South Carolina and that's where I was taken from. And those cases were six years prior. And it's always been my belief that there's other stuff that we haven't found out about. Um, and so he was linked to their murder and um, there was a 
there was a reward for information that could lead to the identification or capture of the person responsible for that. So from that, I, I ended up getting the reward. It paid for my way through college and just kind of living through college, you know, paying my bills. And I went on, I worked in law enforcement all through high school and college. I did, had a part-time job there until I graduated college and I became a sworn police officer. And I did that for a couple of years um, until I had kids. So that's kind of my, my quick flyby of my life and kind of what has put me where I am today, which is I am now, I have a website, like you said, a TikTok, um, gone viral on TikTok several times, doing public speaking and really just trying to encourage people that the things that happen in your life, they really do put you where you're supposed to be, where God intended for you to be. And looking back on my life, if one single thing would have changed, if, if that wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't be here able to speak to people with clarity and compassion and empathy and encourage people that no matter what you're going through, like I've, I've had dark days mm -hmm. and no matter what you're going through, it can be better. And that's just where God put me through the things that happened in my life. So that's really my platform of what I'm doing now. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's deep. That's incredible. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's an incredible <laughs> story. And yeah. uh, uh, something I was thinking about as you were talking is, as you're going through, as you came out of this, I guess, how did you eventually put some purpose to the um, the trauma and everything else that you experienced, you know, kind of, I think it's through that kind of that, obviously I know there had to be some, some trauma, I would imagine from that, that, that horrific experience. You yeah, know? you know, it's, I've always, I think one thing that has set me apart with, from a lot of people that have undergone different traumatic experiences is that just like I'm talking to you today, 18 years after the fact, I could talk about what happened to me in the same manner mm -hmm. the day after. Um, I think I really was able to compartmentalize that trauma when it was happening. And I think that, you know, I, I wasn't this guy's intended victim. I was, I was a crime of opportunity, so to speak. He mm -hmm. stalked girls. Um, I was at a friend's house. Like he, he didn't stalk me. I happened to be outside and he grabbed me. So I was his crime of opportunity. And I think that I was his victim because God knew that inside of me, there was the ability to overcome and the ability to go and help people later. And it, I mean, it's pretty much from day one, I've been able to speak to people about it. And I've almost always just said, you know, if, if one day I can help one person. If my story changes one person's life or their day or, you know, their outlook, then I will consider this successful. And I think that, I think that because I am able to look at my experiences in say a positive light, right. But because I'm able to do that, I feel like it would be negligent of me mm. not to share. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people when they hear something like what you're sharing, they sometimes or in a lot of times they could go to the negative. You know, how is that still affecting you? How is it affecting your family? How was it affected your children? But I love what you said. You said God knew that there was something on the core mm -hmm. that you had the ability to overcome. And, and, and I believe he gave that to all of us. It's just, you have to tap into it. Mm -hmm. You have to tap into it. And I just, I, I think it's amazing. Cause that's a, I mean, it could have went a whole nother direction. Your life could, mm -hmm. that could have not happened. Your life could look different or yeah, that happened. And you could be this person who has just got a victim mentality stuck. about stuff, You're just stuck, stuck in, in that. that. Right. And not coming mm -hmm. out of that or taking that, pain and making it into a purpose, taking yeah. it for purpose. So, yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I've always been a very strong willed individual, we'll say. <laughs> and so I think, you know, from the moment he took me, I thought 
and, and people have asked me, you know, you were 15 years old. How did you have these thoughts? I'm like, I don't have a logical, rational explanation. I mean, I, a lot of people aren't ready to hear the spiritual explanation of, you know, where my mind was at. But at 15 years old, I was like, this man wants to control me. He wants to see my fear. He wants to hear me cry. And I'm not going to give him that. And he told me, you know, I'm going to let you go. In a couple of days, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to take you somewhere you don't know where you're at and, and let you go. And I was like, no, I don't want to wait on you. I, I'm going to do this my way. And so, you know, I think that that accounts for a lot of my, my survivor mentality that I'm strong willed, but also I feel like, um, I feel like God really prepared me and gave me thoughts that, how did, how did I know at 15 years old, my parents didn't talk to me about this stuff. You know, I didn't, I didn't know about sex offenders and, and people who, um, you know, manipulated children. I, I didn't know about that stuff, but, but in my heart and my soul, I knew. And so, I mean, where else, where else does that come from? Right. 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 That is, that is, that's so, oh, it's like, it sounds to me like you had a foundation set already. Yeah. You had yeah. a foundation that was laid. Um, a lot of, and I was just kind of processing it from the, I mean, your adrenaline's pumping. Right. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, your mind can go from, do, to, from here to there, worst case scenario, and you were able to get yourself free. I want you to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, from, from the moment he took me, I knew that there would be a moment that he let his guard down, right? Like nobody can be on guard 24 hours a day. So I was constantly, the entire time I was there, I was cataloging things that I saw. I was memorizing things that, you know, from the number on the inside of the container that he put me in, in the back of his car, to his doctor and his dentist and what the inside of his apartment looked like, what kind of pets he had, how many. I was cataloging all these things because I said, I'm going to escape. There's no question that I'm going to escape. And when I do escape, right? So I had that positive mindset. Like I was already thinking outside of the apartment, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a big, a big factor in survivor mentality in general, just like believing that you are going to accomplish it, right? Or like, don't insult God with your small thinking, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I was constantly looking for a way. And I knew at some point, you know, he would go to sleep. And I knew that that would probably be, that would be my, my opportunity. And so that was, that was when I was able to escape. Wow. Wow. And when you, when you escaped, what was, I know you said, you went to law enforcement. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that was like? Yeah, you know, I, um, so I ran out of his apartment and I experienced that tunnel vision uh, where like, it doesn't matter what happens, right? But I'm out of the apartment, you know, even if he wakes up and looks out the window and shoots me now, like I'm out. So at least there's other people. Um, I saw a car driving across the parking lot and ran out in front of it and it's like, you know, I was kidnapped, the guy in that apartment and like turned around and looked and they were like, okay, okay, get in the car, get in the car. And they're like, what do you want us to do? And I was like, oh, take me to law enforcement. And so uh, there was a region. So, you know, like a regional department. Um, so like a division, uh, like right around the corner. And so they took me there and, you know, I went in and I'm, you know, like in, an oversized t-shirt, hair shorts, no shoes, and I have like a handcuff dangling from one wrist. And, you know, I told the officer what happened and he's just kind of like, <laughs> you know? Like, How did you get here? Time, was, right, at the time I was like, he doesn't believe me. And that was, that was my initial thought. Um, and then he went to look me up on NCIC, which is the database where, you know, like missing persons and stolen cars and, you know, different things are listed. And he tries to look me up a couple times and doesn't find me. And so the whole time I'm just sitting there and this is just like compounding this feeling of disbelief that I'm getting. Right. Um, which later I changed my opinion on that, but I was there for probably like 
10 minutes maybe before he called my mom and told her, uh, you know, that I, that I was there. And I remember hearing her, her voice on the phone and, and, you know, that was just so emotional hearing her say, Kara, you have, like, you have Kara. Um, and, and then, you know, before my mom could get there, the investigator arrived and he was like, all right, you know, get in my car. We're going to go back to the apartment complex and we're going to try to find the apartment. And I was like, well, those guys were supposed to remember it. Like, I'm not going to be able to pick out an apartment out of an apartment complex. Like, they all look the same. Right. And, and he was like, okay, well, we're going to go back anyway and see if you can do it. Cause they didn't remember, like the guys didn't remember. I'm like, cool. Um, but they, um, so, you know, we went back to the apartment complex. I couldn't recognize it. We saw a guy that's like a maintenance guy driving around on like his golf cart. And I described the things from the apartment that I remembered. And he's like, oh yeah, I know exactly which apartment that is. He's like, it's apartment, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the investigator's like, all right, great. And, you know, he calls it in and then we go back to the, to the department. And that's when my mom got me and took me back to, um, or took me to the hospital. Wow. Sheesh. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's... I mean, to be 15 and to, and to have that awareness to even just go straight to the law enforcement and say, right. going home, right? Right. But it's still right. Like that. And so um, wow, that's very, that's, that, that is beyond 15, you know, just to have that. So that's that maturity um, yeah. that you already had at that age. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, uh, Kara, um, kind of, because you kind of gave us the short run of it, so I'm trying to like break it up into pieces now. <laughs> yeah. you know? So after this, after mm -hmm. that, and you know, you're reunited with your mom, what were the next things that happened? Because I mean, obviously, again, this is something traumatic, even though you were very headstrong in it. Right. What happened after this? Like, what was there that took place next? Yeah, so my mom took me to the hospital and there were, you know, victims advocates and law enforcement and people in and out and out. And um, I remember uh, I've actually had to go back. I've gotten my my case file since and I've had to go back and like look at who came in. Cause I, like, I just remember all these people. But it was actually an investigator from Lexington County, which was the county that I was taken from, came in and he had a, a photo lineup that. I don't think they even had the information back from the apartment complex yet. They had just taken all of the information that I had recognized from his apartments, like his doctor, his dentist, his different things. And the fact that he lived in that apartment complex, like the kind of car he drove, they took all the information that I remembered and they were able to figure out who he was. They put him in a photo lineup. I identified him immediately. Um, and then at that point I had seen like my mom and my friend whose house I was taken from and you know, I wasn't really able to see anybody else and went and got um, a sexual assault nurse examiner exam done, which is where they gather all the evidence. And that took, I mean, it, it takes a really long time. Um, and so a couple hours later, I was finally able to leave the hospital. You know, they took all my clothes that I had, you know, like, in borrowed clothes and like hospital socks and walking out into like a hospital room full or like a waiting room full of people, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of my first experience with, you know, different people who I'm like, why are, why are you here? <laughs> like, yeah. like random people. Right. Um, but that was probably the second most emotional thing though, is like walking out. And I remember walking around the corner and no one saw me like when I walked around the corner, but my dad, I just remember my dad, like he was kneeling on the ground, just waiting. And I remember him looking up and seeing me and like standing up. And it's just like, to this day, that just is like a knife in my heart. Just remembering like the look on his face. Cause it's the first time he saw me. And, um, mm -hmm. and so then, you know, I think they kind of gave me the rest of the day. They came and took a statement the next day, the investigators and all during that time, they, you know, they went to his apartment, my captor's apartment. He was gone, obviously. They had no leads to where he was. Uh, he was gone for, I think it was three days. They couldn't find him. And so he, um, <clears throat> he went on the run. They searched his apartment and they found a locked footlocker full of like 
tokens and different things. And they were like, this guy might be tied to some other stuff. So they alerted the authorities um, in Virginia and they, you know, immediately they had this big task force there for these murders and they sent, they sent, you know, people down and FBI down to come and collect the evidence. And you know, it turned out that he was linked to those. They linked him. They were pretty sure pretty much immediately because of the things he had, but it took a little while to link it positively. Um, he met up with his sister in Orangeburg and she, he was supposed to like meet up with her again. And she ended up turning him in, in Sarasota, Florida. There was a police chase and it ended in him shooting himself. So they put out the stop sticks and they sent a dog in, a canine in, and the dog you know, bit his arm and then he shot himself. Wow. That's a, that's a heavy ending right there. Yeah. 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 Wow. I love that, you know, you go, you, you overcame that episode, that, that situation there, and it led to is solving the, the, the um, I guess, the assaults and the, the abuse of other girls who went through the yeah. same thing. So at least to bring some closure to that. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, those those families, they were they had no leads in those cases mm -hmm. whatsoever. Like they would have been. Mm -hmm. Are you guys familiar with the Dale Dinwiddie case in Columbia mm -hmm. at all? It's like a almost 30 year old case and they have zero leads. This girl just disappeared out of five points. I mean, and this is that's what these cases were. They had zero leads. They had nothing. Um, and it was it was two sisters, Kristen and Katie Lisk and Sophia Silva. And they were taken in broad daylight, you know, what, Sophia was taken from her front porch. Her sister was inside. Mm -hmm. um, Katie and Kristen were taken from their mailbox. Like their books and everything were there. Like their neighbors didn't hear anything. And they had nothing. You know, these families had no idea what happened to their children for, you know, six years. And I was eventually able to meet them, meet the families. And, you know, I still, I, I keep in touch with them as much as I can now, thanks to social media, it makes it a lot easier. But, um, but yeah, I, I it, and it's my, it, it's my fervent hope and desire to be able to, to link him to other things because I, I can't in my heart of hearts, just like I knew, you know, what this man wanted from me at 15, I know, mm -hmm. like there is, there is a piece of my soul that genuinely knows that there are other families out there who don't know what happened to their daughters, but you know, I don't, how do I link it to yeah. him? I don't know. Well, we trust the Lord will, will reveal that somehow. You know, yes. That's a lot of pain and, and not, yeah. knowing, not knowing. And so, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So when you, um, so all of this being over, you know, and, and all of this happening, how were you emotionally? Did you go through any counseling? Did you have to do anything for yourself? mentally at that point or did you just <laughs> right. you know i i have realized as an adult now that i'm you know 34 now and i now realize how it has affected me mm -hmm. um just because i have the you know have the foresight now but i really didn't feel like it affected me for a very long time because I could always talk about it. Like I'm talking about it now. Mm -hmm. And which was one of my like biggest pet peeves. Cause I was in high school, right? Like I was a, like a, I was about to be a sophomore in high school and you know, people would be like, S -s 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 -s, right. And I'm like, just talk to me because I would always, I was always happy to talk to people. Um, so I never really went through counseling at the time. I went to counseling um, a couple years later, maybe five years later. And that really wasn't due to anything. It wasn't due to anything related. It was due to, I was in a, a very emotionally abusive relationship for like five or six years. And so it was really more due to the immediate ramifications of that. Um, but now as an adult, I've realized that, you know, that emotional suppression that is very common with children or young people mm -hmm. that go through trauma, right? Like, there's a couple of things that they experience. One of those things is that they often suppress emotions, right? Because it's not a safe space. And I had a kind of chaotic childhood too. Um, so I was, I was used to suppressing emotions, right? Mm -hmm. And so now as an adult, I've realized how, 
how that's kind of affected me because I, I've always said, oh, I'm, not, I'm not really a very emotional person. No, it's not that I'm not emotional, right? Like we're all emotional. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're meant to be relational, emotional beings, but I, would, I just suppressed it. And when you suppress those emotions, eventually the one that surfaces is the one that you can't, con- you can't suppress and it's anger, right? Mm-hmm. So I was just mad all the time. And, and why was I mad? Like, I don't know. I was just angry. Everything just made me angry. And it really kind of peaked having children because I, I think the, the crux of it was I would get really angry when things were out of my control, right? Like, hello, trauma, <laughs> like, yeah, trauma yeah. trigger. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, um, I mean, what are our children, but out of your control? So my children would trigger a trauma response in me basically. And I would just get really angry all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I noticed that now as an adult, uh, you know, and I've, I've actually worked through that quite a bit on my own and, and through prayer and different spiritual growth pathways. Um, so that, and then it's also very common for, you know, people who experience trauma at a young age that they kind of are at a heightened state of anxiety at all times. Right. So like, whereas you might wake up at, you know, on a scale of one to 10 at like a two, uh, you know, stress level, right? Like I would wake up every day at like a five to a seven, right? So like my body lived in a state of fight or flight. And uh, so that would take very little for me to kind of get that triggered feeling. And, you know, I got adrenal fatigue. I had, I had some health issues because of it. And really in the last four or five years, I've been able to kind of work through all of those things and grow and learn how my trauma truly did affect me. Um, but traditional, like how did my trauma affect me? Did I have PTSD? Did I go to therapy? I didn't didn't do any of that. Um, so I'm like, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bad survivor. I didn't do the the, the things that you're supposed to do, but people would be like, you need to go to therapy. And I'm like, don't tell me what I need to do. Like, I'm not, (laughs) <laughs> Let me tell you how that's gonna work. It's not gonna work for me. <laughs> so right. yeah, but it came later you was able to, to see, you know, the effects of yeah. it and then to work through it and then to see that well, there may have been some prior to the incident that you just did not know how to you weren't modeled how to express. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Well, so I now you know you're on the other side of this. You're 34. You've got a couple kids. You're married. Yeah. What is life like for you now? <laughs> you know, it's things are. <laughs> I will say, if I compare my life from you know two even just two years ago, things are pretty pretty great right now. My husband, um, you know, I met him through law enforcement, and. So we met in law enforcement. He went on to do work out of the country. So uh, he started that when my oldest was three or four months old. And so I've basically parented as a solo parent. Like I would never say I was a single parent, but um, my husband was gone two thirds of the year and he wasn't here for the birth of my second. So, um, so it was, it was pretty chaotic right? For a while doing, doing that. And then I had some adrenal fatigue issues where just every day I woke up and I was just like, (sighs) like, I just, I couldn't do anything. And I found no joy and I found no, and I think that that's when I really realized, um, how much my trauma had affected me um, because I, I was so triggered and I was so angry and just being tired, right. Makes you angry too. So, um, so because I have that point of comparison, right. Of like how bad I felt then (laughs) now I'm like, things are pretty great. My husband's home. He's working from home. My kids are starting to get to an age. They're four and six, almost seven. So they're, um, they're at an age where like, things are starting to level out. They're getting a little more self-sufficient. It's less chaotic. Um, and now I'm, you know, putting out content on social media and getting to do, well, once things open back up, going into doing speaking engagements, I'm getting offers to do interviews and all kinds of stuff. So, which was a part of my life that I was like, oh, that's, that's behind me. That was before I did it before I had kids. And then after I had kids, it's like, I don't really want to do that anymore. Um, 
but I ended up getting back into it. And now here I sit with you guys. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So you have, um, you were, your speaking engagements. And I think we talked a little bit about this earlier. You were talking about people coming to you as far as like signs, because you, you hear a story like yours, Kara. And for me, it's like, okay, my, you know, I don't know if you want to call it my Jedi reflex stuff goes up. <laughs> right. And you want to, okay, kind of like even with the human sex trafficking arena, what do you look for? What, what, right. what, I mean, cause some of, the, I've heard some stories where girls were, I mean, he had you for 18 hours. There are girls that people have for months and years. Oh, yeah. They're gone yeah. for a long time. Yeah. And sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't. Right. Um, what do you, I guess my question is, is how do you handle that when people ask you, you know, what to look for and how do you, how do you, how does Kara deal with that? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, I have a tough time with those kind of questions for a couple of reasons. I think, um, you know, I get a lot of the, well, if someone else is in your situation, what would you advise them to do questions, right? Which I understand. And so this is another reason why I'm like, well, God made this, you know, like he not made, but he allowed this to happen to me because he knew that I have the compassion and empathy to explain to people how these things may be hurtful or triggering to other victims. So, you know, people ask me that and I understand that they're asking that because they don't want it to happen to them. They don't want it to happen to their children or, you know, they, they want to know what to look out for. But the fact of the matter is that to someone who has been through that, it feels like what it feels like to us is armchair quarterbacking, right? Like, well, what could you have done differently? And I know that's not what people mean. And I'm able to not look at it that way. Right. Like in that light, but a lot of people would never admit, that that feels like a, well, what could you have done differently to prevent that from happening from you? Or how was it your fault, right? Like, I know that's not what they're saying, but that's what we hear. So, you know, I have a hard time with that. And then I also have a hard time because it's like, I have the law enforcement perspective to give you, you know, what I know from that side, but you're dealing with people, right? Like broken people, evil people that you really can't predict. They're not going to, they generally will follow, you know, a set rule, but you can't. So, you know, like, okay, he put a gun to my neck. I was in a neighborhood. If I would have yelled and kicked and screamed, he probably wouldn't have taken me. Right. And I can tell people that because that is what the statistics show. But what if I tell people that and someone does that and then he shoots them? he shoots her, right? Like, I can't, I, I can't tell you what to do. I can tell you what the statistics and the likelihood is, but also, you know, if I would have kicked and screamed, he probably wouldn't have taken me. Maybe he would have shot me, right? I don't know. But also when someone puts a gun, right? Like here, you, you it's, it's basically impossible to yell, kick, scream, and fight. Like mm -hmm. your body is going to be in survival mode, right? Like that's, that's how we're made. And it's fight, flight, or freeze. And a lot of people are, are going to freeze. And so, you know, I try, I, when people come to me and they ask me questions like that, um, I try to approach it with compassion and with empathy and with the understanding that they really are trying to educate themselves. And so, and that's a really big part of my platform is that I want to educate people. I want people to understand like, yeah, well, if somebody takes you like, this is what you can do. Um, so I try to tell people, but I also make sure to temper that with, you know, but <laughs> this is how it could be conceived by other people. And also, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule. You can't, you can't always say what these people are going to do for sure. That makes a lot of sense because you don't know what the other person is going to do to have the gun and right. what the cases really are. Right. I mean, what if, what if he just wanted to kill somebody, right? Like what if his intent 
was, well, I just want to kill somebody, right? And if I kick, scream, yell, and fight, he's just going to shoot me and leave, right? So I don't know. I can't, I can't tell people what to do. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's like, it's unpredictable, you know? It is. Unpredictable. It could have gone in so many other ways, but. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and you're, and I love what I heard you say. You say you come at it with compassion and empathy. Yeah. You might hear one thing, but you're trying to transpose it in a way yeah. so that it meets what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But showing love and compassion because, you know, some people, you know, it could have been like, what are you talking about, Willis? What do you mean? Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's, you know, I get people on TikTok and, and TikTok is, you know, it's a different for the most part, it's a different age set. Like it's a lot of younger people. So I understand and I approach most of them with like, well, when I was 19, what the heck was I doing? Right? Like I had no idea how to talk to people. And so, um, so I try to approach them in that perspective and say, you know, I know this is not what you meant, but I want you to hear what I'm saying and know how that can be triggering. Um, even, you know, I have a lot of people who are constantly on TikTok, especially, they ask me questions that I've already answered. I, I have, you know, I have a link in my profile with um, my website that tells my story with, with other media that they can go and check out. I have tons of videos where I've like answered questions and done video and, you know, told my story and TikTok videos are like a minute or less. Like you can plow through all of my videos in no time. And so people will ask me questions that I've already addressed. And I, made a video about it one day. I said, you know, that's kind of, um, it can be very triggering for some people because you are not taking the incentive yourself to find that information. You are expecting me to provide it for you. And that is implying that you own my story, that you have the rights to the answers to that question, right? Like, and you're not, you're making me the person who was a victim of a crime do more work to satisfy you. I'm like, that story doesn't belong to you. It mm -hmm. belongs to me. So take the initiative. And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm able to tell people this in a way that they understand. And again, you know, with compassion where I'm like, okay, I'm going to answer this question, but I want you to realize how you can learn and grow from this. Because I think that's, that's our, that's one of the most important things that we can do is take some constructive criticism. And when we make a mistake, right? Like, recognize it and say, okay, now something, you know, made a mistake or maybe something negative has happened in your life, right? How can I use this information to become a better, stronger person? How can I go forth and be better from this mistake, from whatever happened? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, it's a two-way street. <laughs> we have to own yeah. responsibility leaders and understand that you know, you went through that and that's your experience. And right. That's, that's good information right there in itself, just to yeah. understand, you know, that that's your background and what you had to go through and overcome. Uh, question I just, I wanted to ask you is, I think there's a lot of strength that you that you showed in the ability to overcome and to continue to live your life, go to college, become a police officer and things like that. At some point you realize the need for some self care. Right. So, yeah. yeah, so that strength, you know, it was phenomenal that you overcame it, but then you eventually had to learn that, okay, I have some hurts that I've got to work on and some yeah. poem and so forth. If you could just speak to that, because I know about some of your material talks about never, 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 never give up, right? Yeah. So yeah. Huge. But along the way, you've got some, you know, you had some experiences in your life that you had to it. But we all do, whether we had a traumatic experience like you had or or something Absolutely. very different. You know, maybe it's someone in your child someone's childhood that, that was important to them that said something to them that was kind of mean or they took it a certain way. And so all these whatever the experience may be, we all have our own. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think that um I think that a lot of that is, you know, me being strong willed, right? But eventually I realized that, and I think really 
when it, it hit home, I feel like you can kind of skate by without doing things for yourself for a long time. But when you have kids, because they take so much out of you, I realized, Hey, I can't fill from an empty bucket, right? Like I, I'm, I have this bucket and I only have so much to give. And I have these, the, you know, the way I explained it to people, I, I did health coaching for a while and I was like, you know, you have a bucket and it's the amount of energy you have or the amount of things you're able to do in a day. And that's your stress. Right. And when it overflows, like game over, like you, you, you shut down. And I realized that I had these big rocks that were in my bucket that were taking up a lot of space and, and they're boulders and I couldn't remove them. You know, I had, I had two kids, my husband was out of the country and, you know, I had these big things. I'm like, well, I can't, I can't do anything about that. I think it's very hard to see the forest for the trees sometimes, you know, I'm like, well, I can't do anything about my stress. Like self-care, it's just going to be like, what am I going to be doing? It's going to be taking, you know, like a eyedropper out of the bucket. Um, but I realized that, yeah, you can't do anything to take those big boulders out. And I wouldn't want to, right? Like those are the blessings in my life. Yeah, they were the stressors, but they're also the blessings. And so I realized that while I may not be able to take the big things out, there were some small things I could take out, right? like decluttering my house, like as simple as that sounds, like that was one of the things that was a big part of my healing journey is decluttering. Cause it was just one less thing that was just weighing on my head. Right. Um, and then I realized, well, I can also poke some holes in that bucket. Right. And so I was able to, you know, do gratitude journaling. That's one of my favorite tools, gratitude journaling. I think that's really it's a simple, effective tool that is beneficial to everybody because it's so easy to look at that negative, right? And it's so easy to forget the blessings that we're given every day um, because, you know, the negative is more pressing. Um, but, you know, that turns, turns your mindset around in a week. Um, and, and then I realized that I also was not the one that was meant to fill my bucket, right? Like we... I had a friend and one of the things she said to me is she's like, you know, we're not, we're not meant to be a bucket that gets filled and pours out. She's like, we're meant to be a, a sieve, right? Like where God we're poured into by God. And then we filter down to other people. Mm -hmm. She was like, you're not meant to just hold that. Yes. And then like, Oh, my bucket's empty. Like, let me refill it. Um, and I was like, Oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. She's like, you're not meant to manage all this by yourself. Like you have a tool, you have someone who can help you. And I was like, Oh, right. And then just being able to speak things into existence, right? Like I don't pray, you know, like God, please do this. I pray like it's already happened, right? Like God, thank you for healing my son. Thank you for things that haven't happened yet. And I think those are kind of the biggest tools that have helped me to grow and really be able to handle the things that have been thrown at me. Absolutely. Because you took that and then as you got began healed and you began to see a different, different perspective and you began to give a definition to those things. Like, yeah, they were the stressors, but they're also blessings. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. And and which is, I feel like it's something that a lot of people in the world are kind of, we're immediate gratification society, right? So like we see things that happen and we take them at a face value. Like we want, we want to see the immediate results of whatever we do or whatever happens. And so it's hard for a lot of us to see, you know, down the road, how this may lead us to something, something better. Um, but I think that I am able to now look back at my life, right? And see, well, gosh, everything that would have been a negative for so many people, like it's led me right here where I am speaking to you guys and, you know, I'm trying to help other people. And I think that that's just such an important lesson that so many people need to hear right now. It's like, yeah, bad things happen, but, but it doesn't have to, it doesn't define who you are. It's going to make you who you are, but it doesn't have to define who you're going to be. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I think by taking you, 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 your friend told you about, you know, you're supposed to be like a, you receive and then you give. Yeah. So, yeah. So that, so God is filling you up and then he's showing you how to feel by being thankful for everything. Right. 
But then you take those things, those stories like you are now, and you're sharing it and say, this is how I overcame, and this is how I overcame the trauma. This is how I gave definition to my pain. Right. To my also blessing. And, and uh, I think that is just, that's, like you were just talking about, as a special, um, I don't know, practice. I don't, you know, whatever you yeah. want. It's just, it's special. And um, instead of something being a hindrance to you, well, it can actually propel you. Right. And I yeah. think. Yeah. You trip over the step or use the step to go to the next level. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you and I talked a little bit about that when we talked on the phone because we were kind of sharing with each other like the seasons that I was walking through and what you had walked through. And we talked about that. And I think one of the things we did talk about was just getting up every day and being thankful. Mm -hmm. I remember us talking about that. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. being thankful that our eyes opened and, you know, God sustains us. That's a promise. It's right. good. He sustains us, but he also, he, he's made us more than conquerors. And I think about your story <laughs> and it's, it's so evident in the story that he's, he's done that with you. Um, so I want to ask you, um, as far as, did you have something else that you wanted to ask? Yeah, I did I have. I think he did. Yeah, I did have. <laughs> you just knew. Yeah. yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So you, you talked about, you know, you were taught, doing a lot of speaking and so forth before your children, your children came, you kind of, you know, there's a lot going on there. But then just this past season, you made the decision to pick it up again. Yeah. Was it something that kind of pushed you to do that or something happened, you know, I don't know. I... Yeah, I, I actually um, got uh, in contact uh, with Elizabeth Smart. She contacted me through the sheriff's department that I worked at and she wanted to do an interview and i previously kind of stopped doing things because for the most part i was not happy with the way uh, i was presented and it's not that it was negative i just like I, I think i told you guys earlier like i don't like well yeah i don't like things being out of my control right so like i hold things like this and so i would go and do speaking engagements and i'm like I don't like that. I don't like the way it turned out. So I just kind of stopped because it didn't feel right. But when Elizabeth contacted me and she wanted to do an interview, I was like, you know, I would do that because she's going to get it. Like she's not going to try to sensationalize my story, try to make it more, you know, entertainment worthy. And so I did that. And then I, did another thing with her. So that was Crime Watch Daily. I did an interview with her. And then I did another thing with her where it was a round table where we sat down. Um, it was myself and six other ladies who were survivors of being held captive, sexual assault. And it was by far one of the most powerful things I have ever been a part of. Just sitting there on that couch and talking to these other women who just get it. I mean, it's a sisterhood that no one ever asked. And I think Elizabeth said, she's like, it's a sisterhood that no one ever asked to join, but once you're in it, you're in it for life. And like, we get it. Um, and so I did that and I realized that I really feel like I have, I think it's hard to see your own spiritual gifts a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And through doing that and seeing how everyone else was talking and um i was like i i think i'm good at this <laughs> like i think i'm good at public speaking and you know and since then i've had different people who worked on the show you know they're like no yeah you you're good at it and i'm like okay so i should do this um and i was like I, I, again i'm like it would be it would be foolish of me not to do it because I can, I'm going to help somebody. I'm go, I'm going to be able to, um, and I have, like I've already seen the ramifications of me speaking out on social media. Um, and so I want, I want other people to be able to experience that moving moment that I experienced on that couch with six other women who I'd never met before that day, um, with the exception of Elizabeth. And I feel like, we just bonded so much. Um, so I'm trying to help other people who have been through things to find their own version of that. 
So I'm glad you're doing that because it's, I know it's so many people. People would even even gone through that, but they've experienced their own thing. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's all very different, but there's there's something you can take from it. Yeah. It's beautiful and powerful, and so I love that you're doing it because yeah, there Thank are you. so many women and children who have been victims of assault. Like that. Yes. Yeah. One in one in three women, and that's just what we know about. That's just what's reported. One in three women are sexually assaulted in their lifetime. Yeah, like, they don't want to talk about it. They don't. Right, and that, like I said, that's just what we know of. Like, yeah. we all know someone who, you know, we find out way later that it happened, and they never reported it. Right. So, I mean, it, it's something that we have to deal with. Right. Like, and that it's a huge, huge number of people just sexual assault alone. So, um, you know, and then we talk about other different traumas. I mean, everyone experienced, experiences something in their life, right? Like if you know anything about ACE scores, which is like adverse childhood experiences, right? So like how many people do you know that have like no adverse, you know, life experiences? Um, I mean, I, I don't know. My husband is one. My husband, I'm like, he has like zero, zero traumatic experiences until he was an adult. And he, you know, like he was on ground yeah. level forces in Afghanistan. But I'm like, how do you have no, like nothing? I'm like, whatever. <laughs> like, so, but. Well, there you go. <laughs> sometimes it happens, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we are winding down time. I told you that hour would go by quick. Yeah, it did. <laughs> winding down time. So actually you asked this question because you asked it better about getting her to. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, you, as we just got through talking about you, just, uh, you found out that's your gift and yeah. you have something to share and yeah. so you just take a moment and, uh, you know, just talk about, that moment when you said yes, just encourage people who may have something that they need to say yes to or should say yes to. Um, yeah. Because I have a story, I have a gift or something to share, something in the heart, whatever it may be, to take that step of faith and, you know, just encourage the people to, to say yes. Yeah, you know, I think that really the turning point for me was sitting on that couch with those other women and I realized that there and I don't think it was like an immediate thing where I was I like immediately thought I need to do this um, I think it was a slow process where I was like okay you know I, I feel like I would like to be able to go and help people tell their stories and talk to other survivors um, how can I do that okay well I have to I have to get a social media following how do I do that right like so it's kind of this like slow process and then quarantine happened and TikTok was like hot on the scene. Right. So I was like, well, maybe I'll try that because I couldn't differentiate myself. I couldn't make myself stand out on Instagram. I didn't know how to do that. And so I went to TikTok and I found that TikTok, especially, I mean, now it's got a, a huge variety of content, but especially at the beginning, there was a huge movement for positivity. They're very accepting of being where you are, right? Like there's, no, there's really no stigmas about mental health there. There it's like, there, there's very little stigmas in general. It's just kind of like, yeah, man, you come as you are and it's very supportive. And so I found really my voice in that and really was able to kind of hone the message that I wanted to provide to people through putting out content there. And I saw kind of what people needed to hear and I saw what people were responding to. And I was like, okay, so across the board, people need to hear, like, don't give up hope. Like bad things happen. You don't have to let them define you. Like just keep going. Like those, those were the messages that kind of kept popping up in the back of my head. Like these are the things people need to hear. And sometimes, you know, I get asked all the time, like, what did you do to recover? Like, I'm having a really hard time. You know, how do I get past my trauma? And I, you know, I remember one person asking me that and I immediately did a video response to them. And I was like, you don't get past it. Like, don't, don't expect that you have to like climb this mountain and get past of it. It is part of your story. It is part of who you are, but you, 
you just, you live with it, right? Like you have hard things and you live with it, but you, you just keep going, right? Like if you're going to walk a mile, you just have to start walking, right? Like how do you eat an elephant, right? Like one bite at a time. You just have to do it. You just have to keep going. And like, and I tell people all the time on TikTok, I'm like, hey, listen, you're, you're gonna fail. Like at some point, you're going to fall down. But as long as you keep going, you're gonna get where you where you're supposed to be. Um, so I feel like TikTok has been a huge part of my like growth process and honing that message and telling people what they need to hear. Um, but it's, it's been a great, it's been a great source for that too. So. Yeah. So you just, you've had that moment where it's like, yes, this is great. I need to do this. And then people are responding to it. So yeah. Out there and just doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, so I mean, and, and just like so many people have responded to that and they've, you know, they see my, my content and they're like, thank you so much. Like I needed to hear this. Like you've inspired me today. And, it, and I'm like, okay, good. Like, that's my goal. That's why I'm here. I'm glad that you're here. So just keep doing it. You can burn it. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Now, Kara, how do people find you and then support you and, and, you know, just get in touch with you so you can yeah. you know, speak to that. Yeah. How, to, how to get a hold of you. So I am on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. I have the same the same username on all of those platforms. It's Kara Robinson Chamberlain. So it's at Kara Robinson Chamberlain for um, use for Instagram, TikTok, and then Facebook the same. And then my website is Kara Robinson Chamberlain.com. So, and that, it has all my links on there. So if you can remember one thing, uh, Robinson's my maiden name. So everything that I did before kids was under Robinson. Everything I've done after is Chamberlain. So Kara Robinson Chamberlain.com. You can get my Instagram, my YouTube, TikTok, all of it from there. Well, what about your shop? <laughs> yes, I have a shop. Look, I'm wearing, I wore one of my shirts too. Yeah. It says, Trust in you. I know it's backwards, but, <laughs> um, but yes, there's a shop on there too. So I have lots of, um, lots of shirts and stickers and a hat and hoodies and just motivational gear that just tells you like, trust in your story, trust in you, keep going, don't ever give up. Um, and really just, trying to get people to, you know, maybe if you're wearing a shirt and you're like, you're having a hard day and you put on that shirt that says like, never, 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 never give up. Right. Then maybe, maybe somebody out there will wear that shirt and they'll be like, yes, like I'm having a hard day. I'm going to wear this shirt today. It's going to remind me like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> so just one little thing I can do. Well, Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for taking time out. It, it's been um, quite a story. Yes. <laughs> yes. I know. But very encouraging. And, and I love the fact there's two things. You're still standing and you're still smiling. Yeah. Yeah. That's so important. How, I mean, how could I not, right? Like, it's a beautiful, chaotic life, right? Like, my life is crazy and... Like, I mean, I just couldn't imagine not being, not feeling blessed with where my tragedy, where my beautiful mess has ended me up, right? Like, it's a beautiful mess, and, and I'm here, and just, it would be so ungrateful for me to not be smiling and happy about it. That's good. Well, thank you so much again. Yes. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. taking time with us and sharing your story yes. with the audience, and and we're just honored and blessed that you said Yeah, that. Um, absolutely. Thanks for asking me, guys. It's been a, a pleasure. I hear a little the pitter-patter of small feet, so <laughs> perfect timing. <laughs> yeah. All right, dear. Thank you so much again, sweetie. Of course. Talk to you later. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.